decrease attrition rates, the fact of the matter is the industry is getting worse at making decisions about which are the best drugs to bring into clinical development and try to stem the, the high numbers of products that fail during the development process. So what we're seeing now is an average of about 16% of products that begin clinical development will eventually reach, it to the, mar reach the marketplace. And in some therapeutic areas, that's, that's much worse. For example, in the CNS area, uh, central nervous system products for de neurodegenerative diseases or for um, um, psychiatric diseases, the overall success rate is, is only 8%, which means 92% of those products fail in development. I think the, the high failure rates in drug development, the high cost of drug development, and the long timelines to bring products to the market are what are forcing the industry now to start to look at new business models and new R&D strategies that will enable them to um, generate a larger return on their R&D investment. So the former model of what you might call a, a high volume, low margin model is clearly being replaced now within the industry with a low volume, high margin model. And that's where the orphan drugs and the targeted medicines really comes into play. It's sort of interesting in some of the study that, studies that we've done over the years, and we've been following the Orphan Drug Act and orphan product uh, development and approval since, since, the, since the act was signed into law in 1983. And if you look at even the beginning of the 2000s, uh, a little over a decade ago, the number of products that the orphan products that reached the marketplace by in large extent were developed by small biotech or startup companies. And now that number has jumped to about 60, 65% of those products are being developed by large pharma companies. All of this to suggest that large pharma has now clearly identified orphan product development and targeted medicine as uh, an area where they want to be, a, a sector that they want to be engaged in. And there are a variety of reasons for that. One of but them, of course, is can, can, we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a minute. But you know, I, I just want to slow down here for a sec. You talked about the numbers and, and the current study you're working on, but can you give us some perspective how this number has changed over time? Well, the, the cost. You mean the cost numbers? The, the cost, cost and the time of development. Yeah, the time of development has actually stayed either stable or has declined somewhat. Industry is doing a better job of moving products through the process a little more quickly, um, but overall costs have really skyrocketed, and that really started taking off in the mid and mid 1980s, early 1990s. And it's due there are there are a host of factors that are that are leading to that finding, but the it's gone way beyond the overall increase in the cost of inflation. So what we're seeing is these large increases in the cost of bringing products to market. And as I said before, success rates are actually declining. So whereas at the beginning of the 2000s, we saw overall success rates of about 20%, now they're down to 16%, which is a sizable decline. So why, why is it so long and expensive a process? I mean, it may seem like a simple question, but for people who aren't familiar with this process, well, part of it is the types of products that companies are are studying. Um, in the past, we saw products that were often for acute indications. In other words, drugs were given over short periods of time. Think of infection, infectious diseases. Uh, the endpoints are pretty pretty standard, so you know even before you start clinical development whether an anti-infectious agent is actually going to work or not. Does it kill the bacterium in a petri dish or does it not? Whereas the, some of the indications that company or C, companies are looking at now, oncology, uh, CNS disorders, uh, endocrine di and metabolic disorders, they're much more complicated. They're long-term. They require larger clinical data sets, and uh, it's just creating a more complicated uh, drug development program with larger clinical trial sizes. And on top of that, you have the difficulty of recruiting patients for clinical studies, more procedures being done, and the ever-present problem of inefficiency in the drug development process. So uh, walk us through the process for someone who doesn't know. How does a drug move actually from discovery to delivery? What is, how, how does that cost spread out over time? And, and you know, where, where are the bottlenecks, if there are any? Well, the bottlenecks are all over the place, but, but you could say that the, the major bottleneck is right at the stage where 
you're moving a product from from uh, identification of a, of a lead or lead optimization or identification, and then you're moving into the stage of what is now often referred to as translational medicine or translational science of ensuring that that product or that research could lead to something that is actually commercializable. And so we end up with a lot of products that are reaching the mark that are getting into the clinical development process where there is no evidence that that product actually will work or not. And ultimately, a lot of those products fail in development. And I think a lot of the efforts now to try to find better biomarkers and better screens for drug development are, are keying in on that particular issue of why is it that so many products enter the clinical development process and basically the company has no idea whether this drug is going to work or not. It's only based on very rudimentary evidence. So I'd say that the, the, the costs are spread out. The early research costs are very high uh, simply because they occur so far upstream. Uh, the opportunity costs are large and the cost of the equipment used in those studies is fairly large. But beyond that, um, the clinical study costs are high and increasing and still represent the major cost in drug development. So one thing we certainly heard about from, from audience members was how does this process differ for a, a drug that's being developed for a rare disease where there may be very few patients that can be recruited into a clinical trial? Well, the ability to target your, 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 um, uh, your population that's going to be receiving the drug is, is a tremendous benefit as long as you have access to those patients. We have seen cases of orphan product development where the costs are actually quite high because it's so difficult to find the patients for those studies. But today, with the increased uh, um, access to uh, patient registries and, and the, um, the participation of a lot of the patient-centered groups that are helping drug companies, for example, in the cystic fibrosis case with Vertex and the approval of Kaleidico, are really helping companies identify patients that can participate in those trials. The other aspect of it is, as well is that when the product reaches the FDA, the risk-benefit ratio is actually much better than it is for perhaps a third or fourth product in a, for an indication where there are already uh, therapies and treatments that are available. In those cases, the FDA is looking for a lot of evidence to demonstrate that this represents uh, benefit over risk. Whereas in the case of an orphan product, where often you're talking about the first product that's available to treat those patients, the FDA is usually looking at that as a risk-benefit ratio that is much easier for them to accept, and they're often looking for, they need less evidence in order to make a determination about whether to approve that product. So one of the things also we've heard from people who, who want to know, you know, they're desperate to gain access to an experimental drug that may be in development for another indication, but it's possibly the only avenue they have for, for a possible treatment. Why are pharmaceutical companies reluctant to provide access to these drugs that are in development, even when patients may not have viable alternatives? Well, the variety of reasons. One of them is, and this, this goes all the way back to the AIDS epidemic of the late 1980s and early 1990s, when there were those in industry that were very concerned that AIDS patients that were fighting to get access to experimental drugs would make it harder to recruit AIDS patients into clinical studies to demonstrate whether the drug should be approved by the FDA. I mean, it's hard to weigh that balance of desperate patients who are in need of new drugs and industry's demand to get enough patients into a clinical study to satisfy the regulatory requirements of the FDA. So I think that's part of it. The other part of it is when you give drugs, when you allow people to have access to drugs in an extremely uncontrolled manner, in other words, you don't know what other drugs they're taking, you don't know what other treatments they've had, you don't know anything about comorbidities or anything like that, um, you increase the likelihood of finding adverse events that may or may not be related to that drug, which could complicate access of that medication to other patients. So I want to remind our audience again that they can send questions in any time during this panel using the WebEx screen at the bottom, and, and I'll do the best to integrate these questions as we go or save them for a Q&A at the end of this webinar. But let me turn now to Scott Johnson here, founder and CEO of the Myelin Repair Foundation. Scott, how do you see the job farmers doing in R&D, and, and are they going about it the wrong way? <laughs> 
Um, well, it's an interesting question, and there's a, there's a lot of pieces to that answer. Clearly, um, it's a one thing I think many people don't realize is that this is a a many many step process, and different people define it uh, when in parsing things into different steps. But if you're thinking to, to get all the way from uh, discovery biology all the way to FDA approval, there are maybe you know between 20 and 30 steps again, depending on how you define them. And so there's lots of different participants in that value chain. And so I think that, that um, the cost, the high cost of uh, developing a drug was brought up a few minutes ago. And I think the point that was made in his comments were that, that um, you know, this, uh, that many drugs that enter clinical trials, there's very little understanding of just how they work. Um, and um, so they, they don't provide a lot of confidence, really, that they're going to succeed. And, and I think that, that's you know, clearly indicated by the high failure rate. So one thing that, that is very difficult for pharma is to identify what basic discoveries that are made in the academic labs, which is where about half of the, and it's about $65 billion a year spent on uh, research in academic labs. And so it's been very difficult for pharma to take a look at all those papers that are produced with that money and determine which items have the most potential to begin investing in. And in fact, there were a couple of studies that have come out just in the last year or so where companies looked at academic papers and tried to identify ones that they thought had the most relevance for diseases that they were interested in and found that it was very, very difficult to replicate those papers. And so a term that has been used uh, quite a bit is, is the translational gap or the value of depth, which is this kind of vast divide between the academic research and pharma. And so I think pharma has a difficult time determining, you know, what, which of that research to key on and try and invest in. And so I think the, the idea of how do you increase the understanding of the mechanism of action and increase the confidence that something will work in clinical trials is to be very methodical about how you look at those basic discoveries and gather enough data in a systematic way across multiple animal models, using human tissue, uh, employing biomarkers to know that you're actually the compound is getting uh, where you want to go and that uh, you have high enough uh, uh, rates of, of the drug getting there. So you have to be very methodical about that. I think that's one thing that we as a foundation are doing. Is we, now, we're in the multiple sclerosis space, which is, you know, we're, we're repairing myelin, which is for, uh, with damage to multiple sclerosis. And we're trying, what we've done is, is put together what we call a translational medicine platform, which is, like I said, a very systematic way of taking academic discoveries and pulling the data together so that we can interest pharma in beginning to invest to take it uh, towards drug development and at our clinical trials. So, Scott, you, you, you came to understand the way drug development works first as a patient looking for treatments. What did you learn? Well, I think what I learned is that you have, a, as I said, a, 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 a decades-long process, if you're thinking about all the way from doing basic discovery biology to getting FDA approval. You've got, you know, many years. You've got many steps. And you've got many different participants. And I think the, the, the big eye-opener for me was to understand that um, there's no overall coordinator for that um, legacy value chain. And so in looking at all the different participants in that value chain, if you think about academics, and you think of the NIH, and you think of physicians, and you think of nonprofits, and you think of uh, the FDA, and you think of pharmaceutical companies, to think that there's no coordinator to that overall process, that I think is a huge impediment to progress. So we believe that actually the entity among all those participants that has the most freedom to operate is actually a nonprofit. There are things that we can do as a nonprofit that academics can't do. There are things that we can do as a nonprofit that the government can't do. And there are things that we can do as a nonprofit that the pharmaceutical industry can't do. So we really try and use our nonprofit status in a very unique way to kind of be a overall coordinator and manager of those, you know, dozens of steps and over a long period of time. And we think that's really a key activity for nonprofits. So we, we've seen many disease groups get involved in, in funding research or even clinical trials these days, but the Myelin Repair Foundation goes a lot further. Can, can you explain the range of things the organization actually does? Yeah, 
Absolutely. So, so at, you know, we, like many organizations, we fund discovery biology, so we fund academics at, at multiple universities. I think we do that very differently than it's typically done in that we have a uh, clearly defined research plan that we worked to put together. We have a multidisciplinary team that works in a very coordinated fa fashion that we manage. And also, we, we realized that it was important for the pharmaceutical industry to know that the discovery was made, that they would have the freedom to operate to, to invest the money moving forward, so that you need to protect those discoveries with patents. The one thing that we do that's very unique is we have agreements with all the universities where we fund research, and um, we actually patent that work so that we can license it to companies so that they can feel comfortable investing in moving that forward. So we, we, we behave very differently on the very front end of the system. Then, like I said, the second thing we do that's very different is we have this translational medicine platform that we put in place. One element of that platform is we actually have our own lab that is staffed with our own employees. And we take assays, which are test systems, um, that have been developed in the academic lab that we've invested in, and we scale them up so that we can run them at higher throughput and get more consistent data that, that, that industry can feel comfortable. I mentioned before the problem of replication of academic work. And so one purpose of this translational medicine platform and having our own lab is that we can assure pharmaceutical companies that the results that we're showing them have been done in industry standards. So that's very different. And then the next thing we do is we partner with our industry. I mean, many people might view, especially patients with really difficult diseases, might view pharma as, as evil. But the bottom line is that pharma is the only entity that has the skills and the po deep pockets to actually turn discoveries into drugs and fund clinical trials. So we realize that partnering with pharma is a critical part of this overall you know, solving the problem. And then thinking clearly about what the FDA is going to need to see so that you design your clinical trials properly. So we really, as I said, we really think uh, about the entire continuum or value chain from beginning to end and try and orchestrate that as much as we can to have all the participants work together in a coordinated fashion to really get to the overall goal, which is patient outcomes. So you, you talked a little about this before, but why should a nonprofit be in a better position than than a pharmaceutical industry, than a pharmaceutical company to to make these types of research decisions? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is, you know, the bulk of, of discovery biology today is not done in pharmaceutical companies. It's done in academia. And there's a vast cultural divide between academics and the pharmaceutical industry. And I think we're much more suited to bridge that divide as a nonprofit. We're kind of viewed as, you might say, neutral or like virtual in terms of dealing with um, a group of academics and trying to be that bridge between those academics and the pharmaceutical industry. So, so we actually have, I'd say, and, and we have more freedom to, you might say, take chances than the government, than, than the NIH. I mean, um, we can uh, literally play favorites. We can think, well, who do we think are the absent scientists, and how do we encourage them to take intelligent risks? And that's not something that the, uh, that the government uh, funding agency can really do. Um, at the other, other end of the spectrum, we can actually work with multiple companies. We can think uh, along with companies about pre-competitive um, solutions that would benefit multiple companies and would actually most benefit patients by, by having more common standards about clinical trials or patient recruitment or biomarkers. So I think we have more ability to do that. And actually, companies have approached us and actually the word they used were, you know, we're like a neutral convener or an honest broker to work with multiple companies at one time. And that's something that there, you know, really no other uh, participants in the value chain can do that. So in, in the past, you've talked about the Myelin Repair Foundation model being transferable to, to other disease areas. Do you see this as an approach that others can replicate in the area of rare disease, where there may be few researchers looking into a specific disease? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing specific to the process that we're using that couldn't be replicated for any disease. Obviously, in a rare disease, there might be fewer researchers that, that are specifically related to that disease and how to be that smaller patient population. But in terms of the process, I think you could apply these principles for no matter what, you know, how rare the disease was, and it would greatly accelerate moving things forward. And I think it would 
in organizing it in this fashion, I think you would get you would draw more researchers into that specific area because by doing by, by organizing the academic research the way we do, it's really um, in, uh, our scientists will tell you that they can publish at a faster rate than they were. They're doing better science because it's a multidisciplinary team, and I think that those same benefits obviously would, would accrue to a rare disease. So I want to remind our audience once again that they can send in questions as we go using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. But let's turn to Bruce Bloom of, of Cures Within Reach here. Bruce, you take a different approach that, that gets around the high cost and long time to develop a drug by focusing on new uses for drugs that are already approved. Can you walk us through some of the numbers? How do success rates compare to traditional drug development costs and timelines? Well, we think success rates are much higher, uh, and there's there's good reason for that. First of all, a uh, drug that's already approved for use in humans uh, has a, uh, a huge advantage over a new compound that hasn't. We already know that it works. We know what the side effects are. We know what the drug interactions would be. And so there's not the drop-off in utility that you see in phase three trials where you start to see all of the accumulated side effects and other kinds of things with the new compound. So starting with something that's already safe and effective is a great way to make sure that uh, if it works, it can be used. Because there's a lot of drugs that work in diseases that never get approved by the FDA because while they work, they also create more harm than the good that they do. But all the drugs that are already available, we know at least are, have a better safety profile than they have causing side effects. So that's one reason. The second reason is we often have really good anecdotal clinical information that says these drugs actually work in these diseases. And you can find these things out when patients have more than one disease. So they have disease two, suddenly they take a drug for that, and you see some improvement or worsening of disease one that shouldn't be related to the new drug they're taking, but is. And as you start to investigate those things, you find out what the mechanism of action is. And so even before you think about repurposing a drug for a particular disease, you can have some clinical information that talks about how it might work in that disease. So those are two reasons. And I would guess the third reason is when we look at why we would want to repurpose a drug, we do that by first understanding what do we know about the disease that would require certain drug attributes, and secondly, what do we know about drug attributes that might impact diseases, and as we move those towards each other, then we can see why these things might already work. There's, when you add in the, the clinical information, um, that you can see why these things might be, have a much higher success rate. So unlike an experimental drug that is not yet approved, there's no need technically to apply for regulatory approval for a drug. How much proof do you need before, say, the rare disease community and doctors working in the area would, would actually decide to use a drug for a, a new use? That's a great question. So in the business model that Cures Within Reach has, our goal is to uh, – bring together the funders, the researchers, the patients, and the clinicians in a way that the physicians actually treating the patients in the rare disease area and the rare disease patients themselves would have enough clinical information to make a good decision. Typically, our work is in diseases that have no current effective good treatment. So anything that we can bring that reduces side effects, lowers other need for drugs or provide some kind of treatment or cure is a great thing. So typically what we try and do is create a situation where we can have funders fund a clinical research project, a human clinical research project with enough patients in it that if the clinical significance of the success of this drug is big enough, physicians and their patients can begin a dialogue about whether this would work. So for the most part, we're not interested in pushing this all the way through to FDA approval, especially in rare and neglected diseases where there's such a small patient population and where the, the cost to recover that FDA um, review process is probably never going to happen. And we've had some successes in a couple of rare diseases that um, you know I can talk about. One is 
in a disease called autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. It's a disease where um, kids have a, a, mis a bad gene which causes their white blood cells to not die appropriately, not go through the normal cell death cycle, and they build up in the body. And literally, if untreated in their teens, this will kill them from um, those cells occupying normal organ system space. And uh, about eight years ago, somebody discovered what gene caused that. A couple of years later, the pathway was discovered, and it had to do with a pathway that we already were pretty clear that a drug called rapamycin would work. So we funded a mouse study, the mice got better, and then we applied and funded a human clinical trial. And, and five of the six kids, it's a very rare disease, were in complete remission within 60 days of starting on rapamycin. All five of those kids are still on the same dose of rapamycin. And while it's never been approved, pretty much every clinician around the world who treats a kid with ALPS now knows that he should try rapamycin and it'll work for most of these kids. Well, in a case like that, how do doctors and patients learn that a drug like that might be able to help them? These days, it's pretty interesting. So 10 years ago when we were doing this work, there was a lot of effort that went into making sure people were aware of this. But now with the connection on social media and all of the rare disease organizations that are connected to each other and to their doctors, it, the information gets around pretty quickly as soon as the publications are done. And all of our results are published in referee journals. So um, four years ago when we published the results of this autoimmune lymphoproliferative research study, within 90 days, our, the, the lead researcher in that project had received over 200 phone calls from around the world from clinicians saying, I, I read your research, here's what's going on with my patient, let's talk about how we should take care of this patient. And these days, I'm pretty sure it's the standard of care. So our job has been much easier because the groups that we work with help spread the information. Well, in a, in a case like that, does reimbursement become an issue? How, how difficult is it for a, a patient, particularly with a rare disease, to get access to a drug and then have, have their insurer pay for it? So that's really a, a very interesting question. So for the most part, when we repurpose a, a drug like rapamycin for this disease, the kids are able to go off almost all their other medications, and it takes care of much of their disease process. So. On average, in this particular disease, kids were being hospitalized a couple of times a month in the later stages of their disease because of anemia and infections and blood transfusions. And once they get on the rapamycin, all that disappears. So their total cost of care goes way down from maybe a high of $100,000 a year to a, a median of between five and $7,000 a year. So everybody's winning in the, how it reduces the cost. For the patients, there may be some issues with this not being an approved drug uh, for this particular application. But in the diseases where we've done this work, so far nobody's complained about the $22 a week that it costs for the drug versus the $100,000 a year it costs when the disease wasn't cared for. But it is an issue that we're working on. We've been talking to the payers to get them to agree both to cover these kinds of repurposed therapies when they do reduce costs and improve health, and also to maybe help us by letting us share in some of the cost savings. So how does your organization work? How do you decide upon a potential new use for a drug? Is it, is it patient-driven? Is it researcher-driven? It's uh, really an interesting question. So up to now, we've been primarily funder-driven. Most of our funders, over half of our funders are disease-specific, uh, organizations that raise money and want to see patients get better and fund research, and they fund some research through us. Uh, the rest of those funders are either wealthy individuals, corporations, or foundations that like our mission. So I would say 75% of the work we've done is funder-driven, and they say, this is the disease, here's how much money we have to spend, can you help find us a repurposing research project or two? The other 20, 25% uh, comes from researcher driven, and there are literally thousands of these ideas. We've done a couple of requests for proposals to about a dozen institutions that partner with us. And the first time we did that, we had 11 institutions send projects, and we received over 200 repurposing projects in three weeks. 
So we know there's a vast number of projects out there that could help patients. And there are some drugs that can be repurposed for lots of different things. Uh, for example, the drug rapamycin that I just talked about, I would say every time we do an RFP, we get two or three applications for repurposing rapamycin for different things from cancer to rare diseases. Same thing with the drug propranolol. Seems to have some ubiquitous kinds of properties where it makes an impact in a wide variety of diseases from CNS to burns to um, birth defects. So are there, you, rapamycin I think is a great example. Are there other examples that, that you'd point to right now on, on repurposing? For, for rapamycin itself? No, or, no, no, for any other drugs that... Sure. So um, one of the other things I'd like to talk about is not only do we work with repurposing drugs, but there are lots of nutraceuticals out there that have significant drug-like properties but have never been approved by the FDA as a drug. And a, and a different rare disease called familial dysautonomia, uh, a lab at Fordham first discovered the gene and then the broken pathway and then began to screen pharma, uh, nutraceuticals or ways of doing one of two things, either upregulating a gene, because in that particular disease, the patients make about 5% normal protein and 95% defective protein. The defective protein doesn't cause any harm. So if you can upregulate the gene to you know, double its capacity, you're now really up to 10% of the normal amount of protein you need. And then certain other nutraceuticals can change the configuration of the protein where the splicing defect, so that that protein could become functional. And over the last six years, they've discovered five compounds, all of which you can buy mm -hmm. at GNC, which mm -hmm. up the, the protein for these kids to almost 100% and take them completely out of their, their disease crisis. And again, this is $25 or $30 worth of cost per week. And these are very effective compounds that are just as, as powerful as drugs, they've just never been approved as a drug, but you can buy them in standard doses and use them. So again, I want to remind our, our audience that they can send in questions using the WebEx Q&A screen at the bottom of their screen, but I'd like to bring Scott and, and Ken back in. You know, 2012 was a good year for, for drug approval, the 16-year record actually, but there's been a lot of concern about the lack of productivity in pharma R&D, which Ken, you talked about earlier. Can you give some sense of how pharmaceutical companies are reinventing the process of R&D and whether there are any signs yet of improvement? Well, I think there are two major shifts within the industry, and one of them is is the uh, the type of products that companies are, are looking at. It, probably 10 years ago, certainly further than that, uh, no large company really wanted to look at the orphan drug market just because their view is why, why develop, spend all the money and time to develop a new product that was only going to be used by a small number of patients. And that's been completely turned on its head. I think the turning points were Gleevec, the uh, CML drug, the chronic myelogenous leukemia drug that, that uh, Novartis brought to market and has made into a $2 billion drug, and, and companies like Genzyme that their entire business model is hinged on the ultra-orphan market with drugs like Ceridase for Gaucher's disease and drugs for Pompe's disease. So um, there's a clear market opportunity for industry, so I think they're shifting in that way. But I think a more, a more significant and profound change within the industry is the, the move towards more partnerships. Uh, Scott talked about the, the need of industry to work more closely with academic centers and he's absolutely right in saying there's a cultural divide between industry and, and academia that really stands in the way. It's a major barrier to these two sectors working together. My group is in the sort of unique position that we work closely with industry, but we're part of academia. So I sort of see it from both sides, and I see the challenges that both sides have in working together for a variety of reasons, which we won't go into here. But we also see the need for industry to partner with also with public-private partnerships, with patient groups especially, and with lots of other entities, contract research organizations. We're seeing partnerships now with venture capital groups where uh, compounds that industry doesn't want to develop, uh, the venture capital group will form a company around that and then sell the asset back to the company afterwards. I mean, all of these novel partnerships all hinge on one idea, and that's the companies need to 
diversify the risk of development. The risk is what's the greatest challenge for industry right now, and anything that lowers that risk is beneficial to the industry. So the partnerships, the new R&D models, uh, everything else that industry now is really is really focused on trying to way trying to find a way to to minimize the risk. But the other thing that industry is very much involved in now is the multi-company consortia. Uh, groups like uh, Transcelerate, which was just created uh, not that long ago with 12 different companies, uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which started with 12 companies, now has 22 companies, the Massachusetts Neuroscience Consortium, lots and lots of examples of companies uh, in the past never working together, now actively looking for opportunities to share pre-competitive data with the hope of uh, perhaps rising the tide that will help all ships rather than all ships suddenly go down, going down together. So I think those are the major shifts in the industry. So, Scott, have, have you seen a, a difference in the way pharmaceutical companies are, are willing to work with nonprofits like yours? Um, I, I'd like to say yes, but I think it's a slow process because I think that um, historically almost all of the relationships between nonprofits and the pharmaceutical industry were ones where the nonprofit actually paid the pharmaceutical company to move uh, targets or compounds that the nonprofit thought were valuable to, to move forward. And um, so what we're trying to do, is, uh, our model is a little different. We, we think that uh, what we want to do is, 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 is gather enough data uh, and have a compelling argument that industry wants to invest on their own. Um, we're trying to focus our dollars on academic research uh, and also the translational medicine platform and moving, you know, coding the entire process as opposed to funding a uh, pharmaceutical company. And so I think that, that I, I believe that that approach over time will, will generate lots and lots of partnerships with companies. And uh, again, I think it, it's all about, as has been talked about by, by everyone on the call, it's about reducing the risk for pharmaceutical companies. And I think that there's a great analogy that someone told me. You know, it's almost like when, uh, when you make a movie, you invest all kinds of money and, and it takes a long time, and you don't know until opening night whether it's going to really be a success. And I think in the pharmaceutical industry, it's the same thing. You invest a lot of time, a lot of money, you go through a lot of steps, and you don't know until the FDA approves it whether you actually have a product to sell. And so it's a very risky business in that you just don't have an indication until you get to the very end. And so I think look, looking for ways that lessen that risk, that provide more information and reassurance to companies that continuing to invest in a particular compound or target makes sense is, is what's key. So we've seen a number of changes on the regulatory front with the renewal of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which included a number of provisions that enhance the attractiveness of developing drugs for rare diseases. Do any of the panelists see this changing the landscape in a significant way? Um, I could say something on that. It's not just the new version of the uh, user fee act, the FDA uh, Safety and Innovation Act, but even the PCAST um, report, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, both of those authorized and encouraged the FDA to use its existing authorities to speed the development and, and approval of drugs for life-threatening and severely debilitating diseases, as well as rare and orphan diseases. What's interesting about that is the FDA has those authorities, and they've been using those for years. So I think more than anything else, it's an acknowledgement that the FDA needs to adjust its risk-benefit ban ban um, balance which, again, it's, I think it's been doing adequately for, for quite a long time, but to encourage the FDA to continue thinking in those terms of the, the goal is to get these products to the patients that are waiting for them and not have them be held up by regulatory requirements. But the FDA has a, has a full slate through accelerated approval and priority review and, um, and, and a fast track and other mechanisms for speeding access to these drugs. So... One of the concerns people in the audience have is, is knowing about how someone concerned about a specific rare disease can find out about drugs in development or ongoing clinical studies. What's the best way audience members can do that if they want to learn more about what's out there and what's being developed? 
Well, clinicaltrials.gov provides a pretty good landscape of clinical development, clinical trial programs going on in the United States. Um, I think many of the company websites provide information on what drugs they have in development. I think the patient groups and the, the disease-centered organizations are, are terrific repositories of information for patients looking for information on what drugs are being developed. And then there are other groups like uh, there's a one right here that uh, was founded by one of my one of my colleagues in my group. It's called the Center for Investigation and Study of Research Participation, CISGRIP, and Clinical Research Participation. And you can contact them, and they'll they'll help find you studies in any disease area you're looking for. So I think I think there are lots of opportunities now for individual patients to find out what studies are being done and what are the, uh, the specifics for those studies and whether they are eligible to participate in those studies. And again, for any of our panelists, another question about what patients or patient advocacy groups can do to get researchers or drug companies interested in a particular rare disease, how can they best engage them and what can they do to help move a drug from discovery and development to the marketplace? Well, this is Scott. And I guess, uh, in my mind, it's, it's, it's really trying to um, coalesce enough uh, interest and scientific uh, uh, firepower, in a way, to generate information that will be valuable to that disease. And I think thinking about the repurposing opportunity, I think if you, if you um, uh, can understand the pathways that are, are key in the disease, and as Bruce said, uh, look for existing drugs that act on that pathway, and then you need, and I think the one thing that patient groups can do is have, they can invest in uh, assay systems or, or test systems, basically, to be able to test for their disease whether in using that uh, potential repurposing drug, whether it does, um, is beneficial to that disease and be able to gather that data and present that to companies to get them interested. So one of the questions we had was about the role patient registries play in drug development. Anyone have thoughts on, on that and, and how pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies use those and interact with that? Well, I, 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 we have a couple of uh, organizations that work with us that are are working on patient registries right now. and. I think the important part about that is companies need resources in order to do their work. So tissue banks, patient registries, and other things that a not-for-profit organization could begin to put together is going to make their particular disease more attractive to a biotech or a pharmaceutical company when it's time for them to begin doing work. And if they have eight or ten opportunities, and one of those groups has a much more robust patient registry, tissue bank, and other kinds of things where they know they're going to be able to more quickly and easily and cost-effectively access all the patient information, tissue, and participation they need. I think that that's a really important, it's a really important piece. There are some organizations out there that will help small disease nonprofits put together these patient registries or biorepositories. And, um, you know, one of the things that I like best about uh, Myelin Repair Foundation is that in all the hard work that Scott and his group has done, they share it widely with other people so that, you know, you don't have to spend the time and money to recreate the wheel. And there are lots of great examples out there. We have a number of bat disease organizations that work with us. And they've done so much in figuring out how to do this right, and they're really open with sharing with other disease not-for-profits. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is, if you're a disease not-for-profit, a rare disease not-for-profit, look for a group that's already been successful and ask them how they've done it. And for the most part, they'll share all of their knowledge and other kinds of things, including contracts and things, so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. So uh, another person asked about the... Um well, the metaphor was the Russian doll, but you know there are all these incentives today for doing rare disease drug development. Are how much of a strategy is it among pharmaceutical companies to advance a drug to market as a rare disease drug and then find a way to repurpose that to broader indications? Well, 
but you could almost say that that's like hitting the jackpot. You could you could take advantage of all of the of all the uh, incentives to develop an orphan product and get seven years of market exclusivity on the product, and then find that that product is actually useful in other indications. And uh, actually, the three products that became the first three blockbusters that were orphan products in the early 1990s, aerosolized and pentamidine, which was approved only for specific indications in AIDS, human growth hormone, which was indicated only for human growth hormone insufficiency, and erythropoietin, uh, apotin, which was approved originally only for renal dialysis in AIDS patients, became mega blockbusters simply because they could be used in so many other indications. The result were congressional hearings about whether to repeal the Orphan Drug Act. Well, it turns out that there are a few blockbuster orphans, but if you look at the total uh, population or universe of orphan products and orphan indications, the vast majority of those are not big money makers. In fact, they're actually, in many cases, very modest revenue generators for their companies. And so um, despite the fact that there are a few products where you can repurpose them and, and find other uses and generate large revenue streams, that is not, that's generally not the trend. That's not what we usually see. So uh, another question we had was about clinical trial designs and, and the, is there a way for particularly patients involved in the rare disease community to have greater input in trial designs? I take it this was somewhat addressed in, in, in the new FDA Innovation Act, but how, how important is it for pharmaceutical companies to, to reach out to the, someone in the rare disease community to, to help design trials with, with that perspective? Well, I, I, I could just make a quick statement on that. But the, um, I think it goes both ways. Usually the patient groups expect to be part of the clinical trial process and be a participant in the design of the clinical studies. We certainly saw that with the Multiple Myeloma Foundation as they work with Millennium to get Velcade for multiple myeloma on the market. It started way back in the, in the early 1990s with the AIDS groups being active participants working with the companies to develop AIDS drugs, and more recently with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation working with Vertex to bring Kaleidico for cystic fibrosis to market. I think there's tremendous benefit in getting the input of patient groups in the design of the clinical studies, and in exchange, you get access to patients, as is often the case, but also that critical insight from people that have a, a vested interest in seeing that product reach the market. And I would add to that, Dan, that I think, especially in the rare disease world and rare diseases of kids, if you don't involve families in the design of the clinical trial, what you'll find is you might get good scientific information, but you won't get good participation because Taking care of the of the kids who are the patients is a huge time uh, issue with these families. And if you don't find a way to make it work for them, it's very hard for them to do, you know, to live their normal lives, take care of their child, and participate. And I think it's really important for companies to understand that as they're working with their own patient population. So, Bruce, um, you talked earlier about how a drug that's being repurposed doesn't necessarily have to go through a a new approval process, but but one person asked about, particularly in the MS space, you know, why do so many drugs go through new trials and new FDA processes to have their labels expanded? Right, and the reason there is, uh, the work that we do primarily is with drugs that it's, it's highly unlikely that if you took them through the FDA approval process that you'd ever be able to make a profit on them, which is why so few pharmaceutical companies are interested in repurposing generic drugs. There's lots of good reasons to do that, except that you can't make any money. But for a disease like MS that has so many patients, if you have the, um, the use patent on a repurposed drug and if you can reformulate it into a way that you can get intellectual property protection, and it makes a huge, it makes huge sense for you to actually get market approval and hopefully some market exclusivity and the ability to make your money back and then some. So it first depends on the size of the patient population, and it secondly depends on whether or not there needs to be any change in the dosage, formulation, combination of that drug with something else to make it worthwhile for a company 
to take that drug all the way through FDA. So for rapamycin, nobody that makes rapamycin can make any claim that it will treat autoimmune lymphoproliferative disease because nobody's gotten that approval from the FDA. Um, we as a nonprofit can talk about it. Doctors can talk about it with each other because they don't have any vested financial interest in making that claim. But if you're a pharmaceutical company, you want to make that claim, you've got to get FDA approval. So er earlier we talked a, a bit about new R&D models that are, that are being pursued, and one of the audience members asked about open science. And they argue the, the concept could really help bring drugs to market faster, less expensively. Go through the panel. What are your thoughts on the open science, and, and how do you see this transforming the way drugs are developed today? Well, this is Scott, and I'll just uh, comment on that. I mean, the difficulty is, I mean, open science sounds great in practice, and, and maybe if it could truly be done, and maybe I should well. interrupt for a second and ask you give a sense of what open science is, what we're talking about. Well, I, I, I'll, do you want to go ahead and define that? I mean, think you got to, you know, maybe, you, maybe you best if you define it. So th this may be dangerous for both of us, but, you know, when I think of open science, I think of this as, as really the, the sharing of, of work and, and not impeding people from using the discoveries made by others and, Right, and then I think that's I think that's the way I think people generally think of it is that information being shared instantly among everyone, and I and I think the the difficulty with that is I think that the the academic world, which is where most basic science is done, uh, is a world in which the scientists have to have a career, that they have to uh, get grant money to continue to do experiments. And experiments are expensive to do, especially when they involve animals. And so uh, one of the difficulties here is that, that um, the way the system works is you've got to get grant money, and you've got to write papers, and papers help you get more grants, and papers help you get tenure. That is the academic system. And I think that the idea of perfect sharing, unfortunately, is exactly counter to that system. So I, I think that the way we try to bridge that or solve that problem is we have a, a team of scientists across many universities um, that are focused on experiments that, that uh, answer questions for our research plan. And within that environment, within that team, information is shared instantly um, because it's not competitive within the team. Uh, but that's a very you know, I think that it, it's it's a great idea in concept, but it's counter to how academic the academic world exists. And so, unfortunately, I think that complete open science um, is something that I don't quite think is possible. Ken or Bruce, do you want to address that? Sure. Yeah, I, I would just like mention to. that. Um, that a lot of companies talk about open innovation and they talk about it as if this is a, a new concept for them. And in some respects, the pre-competitive space is where they're really focusing their efforts. But at the end of the day, they get whatever information they get out of the, out of the open discussion and then they take it in-house and then they don't share anything beyond that. So in my opinion, that's not open innovation at all. The only case of true open innovation that I know of or crowdsourcing is a company called Transparency Life Sciences where everything from beginning to end is done in an open environment for anybody to look at. The only difference there is they're basically dealing with generic drugs where there's very little intellectual property available or, or uh, at, at risk. And so it really becomes the intellectual property that is the bottleneck here. Most companies will share information to a point but then after that, they're not going to share it because if they lose their intellectual property, then they have nothing to build their business on. So that's the difference between, say, the pharma sector and the high-tech sector or other sectors that have, have, have really utilized open innovation or crowdsourcing in a more, in a more innovative way. Bruce? Well, I, I'll take a slightly different view. I think that if you look at lots of open source uh, innovation in other areas, 
it started with the open source innovation, and that pushed people to figure out ways to utilize it to make money afterwards. We didn't change the incentives first to create a spot where open source could work. And I think the same thing is going to happen in medical research. I think people are going to do this and be out there, and then we're going to see after it starts working, all right, how could we make some money off of this, or how could we do something where we can change how scientists get reimbursed or other kinds of things. So I'm encouraged by the idea of open source. It's a tough place to start because there's no natural incentives, platforms, or other kinds of things. But I think people are going to do it. We're going to get involved in it later this year um, in much the same way that Transparency Life Sciences is to create a, an online forum for the ideas around repurposing generic drugs where there is no patent protection and let researchers, scientists, funders, and patients all get together to talk about this. But I think over the years, this will push us to figure out how to utilize it, and I would hate for it to get squashed just because there's no current incentives. And I've been asked to, to let the audience know that the slides and video and audio will all be available online from today's webinar. But let me thank once again our panelists today for taking the time to do this. Ken Caton, Director of the Tufts Center for Drug Development, Scott Johnson, founder and CEO of the Myelin Repair Foundation, and Bruce Bloom, President and Chief Scientific Officer for Cures Within Reach. Thank you all for your time today. I'm and again, to Thank thanks you. to Shire and Bear for sponsoring today's webinar and, and the team over at the Global Genes Project for making all this possible and their hard work. That ends our webinar. I'm Daniel Levine, editor of the Burl Report. You can find me on theburlreport.com and on Twitter at DSLevine. On behalf of the Global Genes Project, thank you all for joining us today.